I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. The podcast you're listening to right now is made possible in part by my friends over at Juve. Now, if you've been listening to the show for a while or following me on social media, you've probably seen me using red light therapy or at least talking about it. It's something that's technically referred to as photobiomodulation, and it's arguably the most well-researched biohack that I currently use. Seriously, there's over 3,000 published clinical papers on light therapy. What's even more compelling is that over 200 of them are double-blinded, randomized, and and placebo controlled. In short, that means that they've been proven to work. So some of the benefits include improved skin health, increased muscle recovery, better sexual performance, and reduced joint pain and inflammation. So you can see why I'm such a big fan of the red light therapy. And that's why all my friends now come over to my house on a regular basis wanting to use my Juve device. So that's my favorite current application. And if you want to check it out, you can go to juve.com forward slash Luke. That's J-O-O-V-V.com forward slash Luke. And if you enter the code Luke at checkout, you're going to receive a free gift. So as I said, this is one of my favorite biohacks. It feels good. It's fast. It's easy. It's something you can stack with other modalities. Red light therapy is the future. And you can find out all about it at juve.com forward slash Luke. I want you to be honest with yourself right now. Are you getting enough greens into your diet? Now, if you're a vegan and you're someone that eats tons of salads, maybe you are. But are you getting enough superfoods into your diet? In other words, are you getting the dense nutrition that comes in green herbs and superfoods? Maybe you are, maybe you're not. But one thing I can guarantee is that if you're going out and juicing and doing green smoothies, you're spending a grip of cash. I mean, a green juice here in Los Angeles where I'm currently recording can cost you up to $13, $14. And if you leave it in your car on a hot summer day, uh, that $14 can turn into something putrid real quick. This is why I love Organifi.com. Organifi.com forward slash Luke is where I get my Organifi green juice. Really good stuff, super easy to mix into water tastes delicious, has no glycemic index. In other words, no sugar, doesn't spike your blood sugar. It's got all sorts of healing, energizing, alkalizing herbs in it. And it tastes bomb. Easy to travel with, easy to use. And it is super affordable, especially when you compare it to the waste and the inconvenience of fresh green juices and smoothies. So go to Organifi.com, that's spelled with an I, Organifi.com forward slash Luke. And I've got even better news for you. If you use the code lifestylist at Organifi.com, you're going to save 20% off your order. Buckle up that seatbelt, open your eardrums, and get ready for another episode of the Lifestylist Podcast. This one was recorded in London, England, on location at the Health Optimization Summit. Our guest is Dr. Mark Atkinson, and this is one of my favorite conversations of all time. Mark's the founder of the Human Potential Institute. He's also an internationally renowned medical doctor, trainer, and consultant specializing in psychological fitness and human potential development. He's taught thousands of people all over the world, including CEOs, executives, and elite athletes, how to manage and optimize their mind and life one of the most present human beings I've ever had the pleasure of sitting down and talking to. Truly a treat, and I'm so pleased to bring this episode to you. But before we jump into this episode, I'd like to invite you to join me this Friday for a very special bootleg broadcast, The Lost Shangri-La Tapes, recorded in Malibu, California at Rick Rubin's infamous studio with me as guest and Matt Maruka, one of our show favorites, as host. It's one you don't want to miss. Speaking of shows you don't want to miss, you definitely want to tune in for more Matt Maruka next Tuesday for Sunlight versus Blue Light, the ultimate battle for human health and longevity. If you enjoyed Matt's episode last year, which was called Extreme Biohacking, the Millennial Edition, you are going to lose your goddamn mind when you hear Tuesday's show. So we've got two action-packed episodes coming up for you. 
If you don't want to miss those or any to follow, it's really easy. Just subscribe to this show. Click subscribe on your podcast player app, wherever you're hearing my voice right now, and you're going to get all of the future episodes magically uploaded to your device or computer. Here's a taste of some of the value bombs Dr. Mark drops in this conversation. Psychological fitness as a way of being in the world in which you're present, open, aware, engaging in reality, and doing what matters. Why CEOs, executives, and elite athletes turn to Dr. Mark to learn what he knows about psychological fitness training and personal development. The plant medicine experience that changed the course of Mark's life forever. The fact that in spiritual teachings, the ego is often vilified, while Dr. Mark has a completely different perspective on this and values the integration and maturity of the human ego. The critical difference between spiritual transcendence and spiritual bypassing. Evolving from victim consciousness to victor consciousness. The trap of getting stuck focusing solely on physical health and biohacking while missing the inner work. The purpose and value of community and how to build it. And finally, how we're losing our children and societal structure and how to get that back. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode. If you enjoy it, don't forget to get over to lukestory.com forward slash store where you will find my personal collection of every health product known to man that's worth anything. That's lukestory.com forward slash store. And with that, let's go ahead and jump into this enlightening conversation with Dr. Mark Atkinson. Welcome to the show, Mark. It's uh, really good to be here. I'm excited about this opportunity to connect with you and to talk about something that's hugely important to every human being on the planet. Absolutely. Me too. So you're one of the guys that's kind of on the, you know, the cutting edge of the biohacking movement, but having listened to a number of your podcasts and Mm -hmm. especially your conversations with Dave Asprey on Bulletproof Radio, where you guys kind of banter back and forth, I really got from you that you see the importance of mental and emotional and spiritual health. Right. Although you are obviously into all the physical aspects too. And yeah. that's something that I think is often missed within the kind of in the health scene. I think a lot of people think if they go keto, they're going to get enlightened. And you know, there's, there's a lot more to it. And I think the end goal for me is always more from a spiritual development and um, yeah. gaining more enlightenment. And the physical part is just kind of a means by which to get primed as you can emotionally, mentally, and spiritually to get the real work done. Mm. The physical part is just to kind of support that. So right. I'm looking forward to talking with someone that kind of really gets that. Yeah. And you use a term that I want to dive into right off the bat called psychological fitness. Yeah. And I, I think that's a really interesting term. So what do you mean by that? And what's sure. your journey been like? Yeah, of course. Well, just to speak to something you just talked about there is it's hugely important that we acknowledge that life has gifted us this body-mind, for the duration we're here on planet Earth. So it's a gift. And when you receive a gift, the most honorable thing we can do is to take care of the gift and give thanks for it. So really, when people start by working with the biology in the body, that is the right thing. It's, thank you for this gift. I'll take good care of it. But it's not about it because that's just the vehicle. So here we are on planet Earth, We have this body-mind vehicle and we have life within it. And life is the creative animating force that runs through it. And the idea is how can we work with our body and mind in a way that allows us to serve life? And life creatively moves through ourselves. So it starts with our biology, but pretty quickly you'll be well served to turn to the psychology and to the deeper levels, which traditionally you would call spiritual, but I kind of call life. And so psychological fitness is a way of being in the world, in the present moment, in which you're present, open, and aware, engaging in reality, doing what matters. And we can unpack all of that in the oh, next hour. I love it, dude. I love it. I knew I was I'm excited to talk to you. And this is the kind of stuff that's hard. It's hard to have that type of understanding and share moments like we're about to share over right. Skype as we were talking about earlier. So exactly. I've had you on my radar for a while. But I was like, ah, I'm going to I'm wait till I run into him. So yeah, I, I love this. And the talk I'm doing today, in fact, is very much mirrors that basic framework. And I think you just state it in mm-hmm. such a beautiful way. So how did you get started on your path? Like, was it through 
uh, being a doctor or were you on a spiritual personal development path mm. before that? Which came first, the chicken or the egg with you? Right. For me, it was being born into a, a family um, that was naturally curious, just curious about life, asking questions, you know, is the life after death, is the other life out there somewhere? It's just, I guess, growing up immersed in curiosity gifted me this way of relating to reality that really wanted to know the truth. I just always wanted to know the truth of reality and and was never satiated by surface answers. So just naturally orientated towards truth. So that's the kind of foundation. Is is that another way of saying your family were hippies? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) If they listen to this, they would smile. No, they weren't. They were kind of pretty conventional. But my father particularly, it was just, we had great conversations. We That's just had amazing. really good conversations. And where are your life. people from? You, you have kind of a British accent, I think. But... Oh, right. There's a lot of things going on there. Yeah. So uh, I'm British, spent time in Australia, spent four or five years in Canada. So it's pretty eclectic. An amalgam, yes. Right. It's an amalgam. And, um, you know, that's you know, the pieces. Never felt I was British, always had the sense of being a global citizen. It never even occurred to me I would be British or could be in any way located to a particular nation. So I guess curiosity, this kind of very natural global orientation, just when I dial into life, I just sense the whole. That I'm interested in the whole and depth. And so the conversations I used to have, particularly with my father, w- would be attuned to that. So I think I grew up in that and went to medical school and was deeply unsatiated by what I was being taught. I knew what I was being taught was part of the picture, but not the whole. So I became interested in, um, in Buddhism and meditation. I wanted to know everything about nutrition because it made sense to me. Because I knew that when I ate well, I felt so much better. My brain came online. I was a kind of nicer human being to be around. And actually, the turning point for me was um, an experience I had in year four of medical school. Where I did my medical elective. And this is a time where you can go anywhere in the world for six weeks. It's kind of like, you know, for work experience. And I chose the Amazon. And so I went to Iquitos in Peru and I did the usual thing of showing up and really not having any plans whatsoever and found my way to a medicine man who introduced me into a way of seeing reality that changed everything for me and that was using uh, plant medicines. And I emerged from that with this profound (laughs) appreciation Uh. that, oh my gosh, by shifting our state of consciousness, we can access a level of wisdom that is always available to us if we learn how to tune into it and to receive its wisdom. And I came back to medical school and thinking, oh my gosh, do I leave medicine? Because the paradigm and the context for which existence is about is now being irrecoverably expanded? Or do I see through medicine and appreciate it as the vehicle for me being in the world to talk about health in a more expansive way? And I did the latter. And so that really, in that kind of background of my childhood, with a deep immersion in curiosity and an orientation to wholeness, with a very specific experience of expanded consciousness that never really left, it was just from there, it was more about life. What would you have me do? And what I realized early on is that particularly early in life, it's all about, this is my life. What am I going to do with my life? And I realized, oh my gosh, it's not my life. My life belongs to life. So maybe I should tune into what life is asking of me. And then you're in surrender. Then you're in not knowing. And then you're in the most beautiful gift that we have, which is the gift of being here on planet Earth to explore, to explore who we are deeply, to explore life's opportunities, to learn, to grow. And so that really kind of shaped my medical career, my teaching career, my movement into human potential, into um, uh, personal development. And and I just have a lot of gratitude for that. Um, and there was one moment where it really 
um, was the moment I look back and think, that was the moment I got real and just dropped a whole nother level. And I was struggling with addictions for a whole bunch of time uh, with alcohol and some other things going on. And I got to a place in my life where I broke down. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what the solution was. And I felt helpless, open and vulnerable. For really the very visceral cellular level and in that moment of profound, open, vulnerable honesty, there was a shift and a softening in my body and being, which initiated what I would now understand to be like a catalytic conversion in my sense of self and my understanding of what really matters. And since then, it's just been a deep exploration of life and, you know, I just really being so appreciative for life and teaching and doing what I do. There's so much to unpack. I know, <laughs> and right? I have, and I have, I have <laughs> like, there's so many parallels. I'm like, Luke, don't interrupt. Don't interrupt. I really, I have a hard time with that sometimes. So I get excited, but I'm like, Oh my God, there's so much there before you got to the piece of struggling with addictions, which I totally relate with. Um, it seems like you had, what I was going to say was, wow, that's really strange. You were just driven by curiosity and wanting to understand how things work and understand sure. there was something bigger. And that led you into these, you know, more surrendered experience of life. Whereas right. most people, their life is punctuated by some calamity, mm. at which point they're sort of forced into a surrender or opening up a new paradigm of awareness and interest based on being humbled by their circumstances right. and their experience with life. So I was kind of like, whoa, he's one of the rare few that like didn't come into this life as suffering, <laughs> right? As being the motivator, which was definitely my case. I didn't like you talk to me about God. I would run out of the room until I was like, hmm, well, there's nothing else left. Maybe I'll try God. So at what point um, did you go to Peru and have those shamanic experiences with the plant medicine mm. before the addiction stuff really yeah. came to a head? Yeah. Uh, I, interesting. I, and I appreciate it's levels and layers. Right. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> you know, one thing I've come to learn is that anytime you think you figured it out or you've arrived or you're there, you haven't. Right. And <laughs> so, you know, the kind of plant medicine experience was, I guess, in my early 20s. Um, but in a way, is like I look back at that time and I had no idea what I was doing. I was just in my head, in my conditioning, trying to become someone who I thought I should be, seeking approval of the people around me, being disconnected from who I was and what mattered most, really quite disorientated. I had this expansion, but I didn't have the mature functioning ego to work with that expansion. And what I realized and what I saw was that the ego very quickly grabbed hold of it and was starting to shape an identity around this kind of somewhat awakened, enlightened person. And fortunately, yeah. I had this voice come from there and said, don't go there. <laughs> it just, just soften. It's going to be a okay. That's yeah. amazing, dude. Yeah, I, I know about that building the spiritual ego. Yeah. And I think that's one of the, <laughs> the phenomenal things about the ego's capacity <laughs> is that it will shape shift and really glom onto anything it can. You know, if you become a holy person, the ego goes, ah, I see an in here and you become the holiest person, right? <laughs> Holier than now, right? And that pious sort of thing. Yeah. And I had a similar experience when I went to India uh, many, many years ago and was, I went to this place called Oneness University and mm. I was, you know, sanctioned to do this certain kind of blessing called a diksha. And it was mm. this very sort of expensive, prestigious training as it were a 21 day silent retreat. And I traveled all through South India and visited some of my favorite gurus and whatnot. Mm. But I came back to the States wearing beads, doing namaste at everyone. And I had a very practical spiritual teacher at the time who was like a biker from Louisiana <laughs> that smoked cigars and swore like a sailor. And I came back doing the namaste thing. And he was like, get the <laughs> fuck out of here. He was not having it. So I didn't have the self-awareness, but he just shot me down yeah. like so fast. Yeah. And I was like, dude, your ego is now yeah, attaching to this other identity where before maybe it was like, oh, I'm Mr. Cool Hollywood. I play in a band. And that was some identity that I'd formed in my twenties and came out of that. And then mm -hmm. went into like, now nah, I'm a spiritual guy that does yoga and wears beads. Yeah but I'm still sort of getting my sense of self-worth exactly. based on an external presentation. You yeah. Know? So yeah. it's, it's, yeah. 
it's fun to go through those stages though, isn't it? When it you look is. back, you're like, oh God, yeah. oh my God. I yeah. remember the days. And I'm sure even now to some degree, I'm, you know, have some sort of identity that the ego's wanting to play off in some capacity too. But it's yeah. just it's in the awareness that it sort of melts away. So yeah. something I think is fascinating that you talk about and it's presented in different ways based on someone's framework of understanding, mm-hmm. and that is this idea that it's not about getting rid of ego. It's about the maturity of the ego and the awareness really? of the ego. Cause you, could you take us into a little Definitely. of that? Cause yeah. from the, from the most popular framework, I think of spiritual development, it's like, and even especially in religion that the ego is vilified as sin and our right. base animal instincts are to be loathed and mm. be gotten rid of when we know that that's not possible. So right. how, how can we integrate those natural drives and the natural mm. God-given capacity of the ego to work on our protecting our personality and allowing us to operate in the world in our physical mm. body, which I think right. is kind of how I understand it. So what's yeah. what's your viewpoint of how to work with ego? Yeah, right. So exactly. So, and what I offer is just a viewpoint, right? But my understanding is that if you have a body, you have an ego, the ego is built into the body for its survival purpose. And so what happens is it's a developmental thing. We enter into childhood. We get overwhelmed by experiences. We make conclusions about those experiences. And so we develop this kind of firewall around us. So the firewall is the egoic personality. And it's designed to get us through childhood into adulthood. It's a survival mechanism. It's a beautiful thing. We should give thanks for that. But then what starts to happen is in adulthood, it starts to provide and become a source of limitation for us. And so what we have is like this, basically you can think of ego as like this psychological scaffolding that we've erected. And there's images about who I think I am and who I think I should be. It's peppered by shoulds and should nots and beliefs about everything about life. Um, And what starts to happen, you realize is that that is nothing to do with who I am. And so what the whole focus of my work in psychological fitness is about is realizing we have two dimensions of being. We have the surface level that you could call the everyday ego. And the everyday ego is focused on me. It's all about me. It has a really important survival function that we want to retain, but we don't want to take our identity from it. And here's the thing. And most people listening to this will have a very busy mind. It's full of mental chatter. You are not those thoughts. You have thoughts, but you're not those. They're nothing to do with you. They arise from your conditioning within your psychological system. So the beautiful thing with ego is it's a survival-based mental construct, but the problem is it's fear-based. And so what you discover, and we can explore this because really the most of my work is experiential rather than conceptual, which is you can attune to this present moment in a way in which you actually descend beneath the level of mental chatter and you encounter this open, spacious, aware presence that is your true nature. And so the whole focus of my work is attuning to that, living from that, learning to welcome and work with your egoic patterns in a welcoming way because fundamentally at the heart is just life. It's life arising in ego shape. It's life arising as this thought. It's not implicitly wrong. Everything about it is beautiful and right when you see it in a particular way. Right. So it's like at a certain stage in my in my journey, uh, I started discovering these they were these big uh, tape sets of spiritual teachers, you know, Stuart mm. Wilde, you know, Stuart Wilde, he's a British guy. Right, yeah. No one knows him in the States, yeah, but he, he's one of my yeah. favorites. Um, and, you know, Wayne Dyer, Deepak Chopra, sure. all, all these guys. And I'd be driving around in LA traffic and they would be describing in, in essence what mm. you're talking about, you mm. know, living from that witness position, not just yeah. having a meditation where you're aware that there's a you and there's a you watching the phenomenon of thought right. and feeling. But the, the idea that you could actually carry that into your life and keep that awareness and that in and of itself, that practice of awareness is what frees you from the bondage right. of being in a constant emotional, egoic, mental state. So I'd be mm. listening to these tapes and they'd be explaining that. And that's how I learned to start doing it in real time. Because I would see my ego would get threatened by someone driving too close to me. Sure. Right. And I would want to kill them. Right. 
And I thought, God, I'm a horrible person. No, I'm not. It's no. just, it's my ego wanting to make sure I don't have to pay money to fix my car. Right. Wanting to make sure that I don't get injured. It's just, it's it like, cares. It, it's, it, yeah. it cares in the only way it knows how to care. Right. Because that's what the ego does. It's just, it has a certain flavor and a way of being in the world. And so when you see that, you realize, okay, so when those patterns happen, you can just simply welcome the underlying tension because the physically felt aspect of the ego is tension in the body. Mm. And so one of the first things I say- Is that why people that are, I always think people that are very serious are in their ego. That's the right. vibe I always get. If someone's yeah. just really fucking uptight, I'm like, ah, it's just, he's yeah. trapped. Yeah. Would you, you say that's you know what, accurate? You know what, I'd say it's accurate. And you know what the antidote is? To keep softening. To keep softening. So it looks like this. And anyone who's listening to this can practice this right now. So if you look around the room that you're in, and don't do this if you're driving. So what you're looking at now is the stuff in the room. It's called content. Now, notice the spaciousness in the room. As you tune into the spaciousness, allow your eyes to go soft. So it's soft eyes. Tune to the spaciousness. As you breathe down into your lower belly, Count down from five, soft eyes, tune into spaciousness. And if you allow this without effort or trying, what you'll notice is a personal sense of you has gone and there's just a sense of open, aware, spacious presence. This is who you are. In any given moment, my invite, my recommendation is keep attuned to spaciousness as you go about your life. And you're keeping attuned to both the content of life, the stuff that's happening, we call that life situations, and to the context of life, which is life itself. And here's the amazing thing. The resources we need to deal with life's challenges, we can receive as we remain attuned to this fundamental awareness. And so here's the thing. We didn't have to go meditate to make that happen. It was just simply a very simple perceptual shift. We become so tense in our eyes, focusing on our mental content as well as our external content. And that puts us into a self-imposed prison. We feel disconnected from life. We feel that we're missing right. out. We feel fundamentally flawed. No, here's what you do. You just attune to spaciousness all around you. And as you sink into that, you make contact with the fullness of life the wholeness of your being. Everything you seek is already here. We just have to cultivate the capacity to notice it. So people are seeking because they feel a deficient in happiness and joy. They look for happiness and joy outside of themselves. They look for love outside of themselves. Are you kidding me? It's here. It's just we haven't yet developed the capacity to see it and receive it. So learning how to master your focus and your perceptual capacities is profoundly important. And that's really the foundation of psychological fitness. It basically says there's two levels of you, the surface, which is where the ego is at. And if you live from that, you'll be very mental in your head and your whole world will be full of thoughts. It's thought-based. And you'll only ever see the surface of reality. And if you, and if you feel on the inside, you will feel empty. You'll feel disconnected. You'll feel a sense of something's wrong. Something's missing. I don't have enough. I am not enough. It's an empty hole. But if you take a moment to shift your perception to the spaciousness around you and within you, everything changes. It's like suddenly I'm here, I'm connected. There's a sense of well-being. There's a sense of joy. There's a sense of tenderness, intimacy, connection. It's all here. Well, that's interesting because all I did was just change my focus. And so what happens is as you learn to live from this, and you start to decondition. Because that's what the ego is about. You start to decondition, start letting go of your limiting beliefs and your stuck emotions in your body. So as a general rule of thumb, anything we don't feel and honor and allow to move through us gets stuck in our system. Most of us are psychologically constipated. That's why we don't feel connected to life. That's why there's no joy flowing through us. So as we start to let go, to welcome and to let go, life will clear us out. Life will clear us out until we get to the most wholesome natural place we can be, which is to be a vehicle for life, a co-creator in life. And this is just a simple set of skills that anyone can apply. I teach this stuff to my children and it changes everything. It's interesting that you talk about the context 
you know, the things happening kind of within the field and then the content, which is the field itself. Right. And I think that the old school model of a spiritual aspirant would be um, one of renouncing the world, right? And you yeah. have to go live in Sedona or live in a cave in the yeah. Himalayas. Right. And you're, you're just going into the world of, of context, right? Yeah. And letting go of content That's and attachments right. and all of that. And almost yeah. from the Buddhist perspective too, yeah. probably have a misunderstanding of it to some degree, but you know, the attachment to the corporal form and the material world is what keeps you stuck in bondage. So right. on the one end of the spectrum, it's like, okay, so I need to let go of all of the content and just focus on context. But yeah. then does that not take you out of the world and render you ineffective in actually creating any sort of change or reverberation of that energetic field yeah. or the enlightenment, which you may or yeah. may not attain yeah. from that worldly focus. But right. what you're describing where there's an acknowledgement and acceptance of the content of the happenings within you know, right. emotionally, mentally within the field. Right. Yeah. But also keeping, I always think of it as like having one finger in the pool or I'm right. tethered to consciousness or God or whatever one would call it while still being operational and answering right. the phone and doing the emails and making money and having the kids and yeah. buying a car and, and doing all the householder sort of yeah. practices that are necessary to operate within the world. Yeah. So w- would you say that this approach that you're describing is kind of a way to have an active surrendered life mm. where you're effective and you're taking actions, but within the base of your life, it's coming from a place of surrender and really focusing on the context. Right, exactly. And right? You, you use a phrase I use, active surrender. It's exactly that, which is that when people are looking to transcend life, that is step one. You've got to transcend the content to rediscover yourself as open, spacious awareness. And from that, become intimate with everything. So when I talk about psychological fitness, you're present, open, and aware, which means you're here, attuned as awareness, engaging with reality. And here's, for me, the true mark of where you're at in spiritual development is, are you able to be open and respond openly, freely, and fully to everything in life? And that means there is nothing I will not turn towards and allow intimacy to be with. So here's the thing. Yeah, you can be in awareness, but the next level beyond that is intimacy with everything from awareness. So wherever you're And that greatest, requires you being in the world. You've got to be in the right. world. And right. I would say that is where the greatest awakening and embodiment is. Is like, you know, I'm a father, I'm married, you know, I run a business, all that. That is where the joy is. So we have to come out of our compulsive identification with the surface level. You've got to find your way, and the tradition is through meditation, but what I teach is a direct approach, which is moment by moment, you're just attuned to spaciousness. There's no effort or trying. There's no one trying to make it happen. There's nothing you can do to make this happen because you are awareness. The ego will always say, well, what do I need to do, Mark? You don't need to do anything. Just notice awareness is you and it's here, right? And from that, be intimate, allow intimacy with everything. Now, here's the amazing thing. Awareness is naturally intimate. Awareness holds. It's the foundation. So you don't even need to be intimate. Intimacy is happening. This is a refined perception that unfolds over time. But for people who are trying to escape life, I understand that impulse. I really get it, which is life is challenging, life is painful, and we're we're seeking safe refuge in this comfort of transcendence. I get that. I really understand that. But please know that is not spiritual development. That's spiritual bypassing. Spiritual maturity is to be here, present, open, and aware, engaging with reality, doing what matters. Now, doing what matters is whatever you're moved to do. That normally means it's aligned with your values and it's aligned with this felt sense, not a cognitive, a felt sense of what is right and true. It's about deeply being in the world, being intimate with it all, engaged with everything. And it's making a commitment. There is no domain of life I will not look at. If my financial issues, financial issues, relationship issues, I will look at them from awareness and work through it. It's deep engagement with life consciously. Wow. Amazing. 
So when you use the word intimacy yeah. in context to having intimacy with your present reality and with life, mm. what would be your definition of intimacy yeah. in a global sense? Yeah. So, you know, I think of it as a, a if I have intimacy with the person, like you and I are having a re- yeah. we're sitting close, we have eye contact, there's one other person in the room, a couple of cameras, some mics, but it's a quite an intimate conversation because we're is. just going deep. Right. And I think what allows me to be able to do that is relaxing my nervous system and yeah. reminding myself that I'm safe to be vulnerable and to right. be close to another human being, not only physically proximity wise, but in terms of just energetically. Right. So the intimacy with mm. another person to me is more tangible. Yes, of course. Whereas intimacy with the greater yeah. whole is a bit more yeah. vague and nebulous. Exactly. Could you explain that a little? Yeah, of course. Well, of course, it can't be explained, but just experience. But pro- <laughs> yeah. pro- probably the easiest way of understanding is is yeah. a feeling of interconnection. It's just you're here in life, feeling connected in the whole. And as you look around at life, there's nothing you feel separate from. It's a state of non-separation. Let's look mm-hmm. at it that way, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And then as you feel more into that, there's a tenderness, there's a care, there's love and this, and it's almost like if you relax more into it, you can start to sense the deeper levels of it. And this experience is like this deep intimacy of what is from what is. So we're here as awareness. So if I'm in my head and ego, none of this will make sense. None of this is like, what on earth is that guy going about? Yeah. Well, that would be like sitting on the beach and I'm in the ocean. I'm saying, come into the ocean. And you go, well, I ain't going to get in the ocean. Well, you're not going to know what it's like to feel the wetness of the ocean or to feel the warmth of the ocean. You have to get into the ocean to know the ocean, right? So if I'm committed and loyal just to my head and to my ego and the surface level of reality, I will not know in my experience what it's like to be in the ocean. So that's why psychological fitness starts with learning to attune without any effort to the awareness and spaciousness all around you. That brings you into the ocean. And then from there, without effort or trying, because the moment there's effort, trying or grasping or owning, the ego's back in it, you're back on the beach. From there, as you continue to, this is important, sink. As you sink in to the ocean, you can start noticing different dimensions of the ocean. There's joy, and you just receive it. There's love. There's stillness. And so you can feel the stillness. And then you look around from awareness, and there's nothing you're not connected to. Now, what's amazing, and this is the big surprise, is your capacity to then respond to life improves immeasurably because you're so dialed into it and attuned to it. What you find is unencumbered by the mental static of the ego. So the physically felt component of the ego is tension. The cognitive component of the ego is mental static, right? It's just self-referential thoughts all over the place. From that awareness... Painful white noise. (laughs) Painful white noise, right. And I know it well. Because... You know, we both used to live with that. Yeah. It's only when you're free from it. Why do you go, oh my gosh, I had no idea. I often say the difference between living in awareness and ego is if you can imagine having this headset on, when you're in ego, you're listening to Radio Me. You have literally placed on a headset and you've tuned into Radio Me. And the source of what you hear is your conditioning about you and life. What you're learning here is to tune into Radio Life. It's just an attunement. You're just learning to change channels and it changes everything. And so if anyone's listening to this and they have compulsive mind chatter, constantly in fear and anxiety and worry, they feel insufficient, they feel discontented, the diagnosis is you have become identified with something you are not. You've become identified with this mental construct called ego. That's not a problem because we all start there. It's developmental. The next developmental stage for you is to allow yourself to wake up from the dream of separation and to be brought back deeply back into reality. 
which is awareness. There's nothing for you to do. All you need to do is start practicing tuning into the spaciousness in and around you and trusting that and sinking into it. Now, the people, the reason people are doing this is because it requires us to step into not knowing. The ocean is not knowing. And the ego wants to know everything because it's fear-based. And so if you're willing to be in the world in a way in which you're not knowing, you know nothing, and what you discover is, oh my gosh, by not knowing, you receive intuitive knowing. You just know. And you're moved. And you realize, oh my gosh, I thought my life was all about me. No, it's about life. It's just one life unfolding in many, many different appearances. You're an aspect of that life, just like on this hand, you're one finger, I'm another finger, the whole thing is moved by life, right? There's life and there's life forms. And so when people start with hacking their biology and their body, which is a beautiful thing, that is the developmental milestone. It goes from victim consciousness, which I call stage one consciousness, to stage two consciousness, which is victor consciousness. It's about taking responsibility, which is I can't rely on the people around me to make me healthy. I must do it myself. It's a beautiful thing. So I take charge. So Victor is all about I take charge. The next developmental leap is to vessel consciousness. And that requires surrender, softening, and letting go. So completely what got you to where you are will not get you to where you're going. So you need to take charge to take care of your body and your health. But the next level beyond that is to simultaneously let go and soften and open up to the deeper level of reality that we call awareness. And when you live from that, it changes everything. Your mind is clear. You feel deeply connected, deeply grateful. You experience a sense of well-being there most of the time. And there is nothing you're not willing to look at. And when you get activated and triggered, because that is what happens, because we carry our old psychological conditioning, you turn towards it, you notice it, you welcome it, and you allow it to flow out of you. You work with it. Not as an attempt to get rid of it, but by exploring it. You're welcome to work through your stuff. There's nothing I'm not willing to look at. In fact, when stuff comes up, I'm just fascinated. Oh my gosh, isn't that amazing? When I was with that person, that judgment came up. That's just about me. Where's the tension? Oh, here's the tension. Anyone who's stuck in conflict or resentment for more than one minute is stuck. You have stuck energy in your system. Notice where the stuckness is and you will have tension in your body. Welcome it. And there's something beautiful. We say this is the first practice in psychological fitness is welcoming. And what that means is in any given moment, whatever is coming up inside of your body, whatever's showing up, welcome it. Even you're in a critic, just turn towards it and say to it as sincere as you can, I'm pleased you're here. And soften your eyes, soften your body. And what you will discover is the moment you align with the actuality that this is here, you relax, you soften, you deepen. And actually that tension tends to just then flow out of you. And you come out of the trance. You can think of another way when you live from ego, you're living under the influence of a spell. You're spellbound. You ain't in reality. Another way of describing it is in any given moment, you're either above or below the line. Above the below, uh, below the line is your unconscious, identified with ego, attempting to control reality, normally in defendedness, and your clothes. To be under the line is to hold your breath. When you learn how to shift above the line into presence and awareness, you feel free. You feel connected. You feel open and expansive. And so when you really start to understand, oh my gosh, in any given moment, I can influence the way I experience myself and life by just simply the way I shift my focus. And so rather than tune to radio ego, go to radio life. And it's a game changer. And then you can build your life from that. And then you become a nicer person to be around. You become present, open and aware, engaging with reality, and then doing the things that really matter. You're really dialed into what really matters, and that's what you put your time and attention to. We'll be right back at you after this brief but important announcement. 
I've been studying not only the cause of modern disease, but also natural treatments for those diseases for over two decades. And after all of that research and everything that I've learned, one of the most important things that I've discovered is the fact that many of our diseases are caused by non-native blue light. That means exposing ourselves to alien light after dark. You know, we've evolved to only see firelight, moonlight, and starlight after dark. But when we invented the incandescent light bulb, which I'm sitting under right now, and I'm so grateful for, we basically trashed our health. So if you're someone that cares about your health, it's really important that you start protecting yourself from blue light at night. And that means all the white light all around you. It's really easy to do that thanks to a company called Blue Blocks. If you go to blueblocks.com, that's B-L-U-B-L-O-X, you will find a variety of eyewear, much of it very attractive, also have prescription glasses, reading glasses, and just regular glasses that protect you from blue light. And these glasses they make block 100% of the light in the negative range. In other words, don't tell your brain that it's noon when it's midnight, guys really, really easy fix. And the health problems that result from this exposure to blue light are endless. I don't want to use the C word and I'm not trying to like use scare tactics, but it's honestly just the reality of it. So many of our modern diseases come from exposure to this light at night. It really trashes your sleep and melatonin, neurotransmitters, hormones. It totally sucks. So get out in the sun as much as you can safely, get natural light in your eyes. And then at night, protect your brain and your eyes from blue light using Blue Blocks. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X, blueblocks.com. Here's the really good news. If you use the code LIFESTYLIST at checkout, you're going to save 15% off your protective blue blocking eyewear. And now back to the interview. Having been someone for a long time that's been practicing what you're describing in, in its essence, um, Perhaps I might use some different words to describe it, but essentially that surrendered action, you know, of having a mm. framework of one's life that is surrendered, knowing that there's a higher intelligence right. and a, a universal force for good, a benevolent uh, creation, creator that's aware and awake that I can that I can correspond with and relate to that's right. going to guide me when I'm able to follow more of that intuitions through, through presence and all of the stuff that mm. you're describing and getting a, you know, at first an intellectual understanding of these frameworks and then sure. to start to apply it in daily life where it yeah. starts working and you're like, Holy shit. Right. I just got a parking ticket and I don't care at all. Yeah. You it's know? okay. And then maybe it's a divorce. Maybe, you know, they get, right. there's bigger triggers. <laughs> right. However, I still find, and, and I know this is true for many people I know. And I think, Maybe more so for people that have really hard uh, addiction past, mm, you know, people, mm. sober people that, you know, are lucky to be alive, but they're here and they're doing the spiritual thing. Uh, is that it seems those of us that have had a lot of trauma, right? You know, childhood trauma. Yeah. Even ones like me that have been dedicated for a long time and doing this work that you're describing are still victim to, at times, that. You know, perhaps the damaged amyg- amygdala. Yeah. I mean, I, I could get the brain anatomy wrong, sure. but as I understand it, you know, your your amygdala gets hurt, damaged. Yeah. There's an imprint when you're a kid, especially yeah. before seven. And then way later in life, even if you become super spiritual and you're the fucking Dalai Lama 99% of the time, that there are certain things. For me, it's usually in the realm of re- interpersonal relationships, right. romantic relationships where I'm so good and I feel like I have life so sorted most of the time. Uh, that something can happen and it can be so dysregulating yes. that there's no getting back to the place that you're talking about of that awareness that it's just been hijacked That's right. by cortisol and adrenaline yeah. just pumping out like you're that kid getting beat on or whatever your story was, yeah. screamed at, you know, yeah. which is, I had a bit of both of those. Yeah. And there's this terror and this fight or flight thing that comes on and it yes. almost sucks worse when you know what it is and you can't get I out know, of it. Because right. when I feel it yeah. happen to me, which is yeah. you know fairly rare, thankfully yeah. at this point, but still when it happens, I'm like, ah, oh, God damn it. I'm yeah. stuck. I'm in the thing. Yeah. 
And then my mind, because it's in pain, and then my awareness knows that the mind and the ego are entrapped in this chemical yeah. sort of dump that's happening. And I feel that fight or flight tension in my body. Yes. Then it wants to get rid of the pain. So it's of like, course. okay, what supplement can I take? What meditation can I do? Who can I call? What you know, therapy group? It's like, it wants mm. to run and get out of it. And it's almost yeah. like the more one fights that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. It's like trying to pull your way out of handcuffs, you know, they get exactly. tighter. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. how does how yeah. does how do we how work do, with yeah, that? How does and, trauma play yeah. into it? And yeah. is there a way to just prevent that deep suffering from happening yeah. ever? Yeah. You know, like yeah. is is there a yeah. secret to it? Mm, yeah. I don't know if there's a way to prevent it. What I would say is completely normal and natural as part of being human being. Right. With two dimensions, we're human which is all the trauma, addictions, kind of what we would call messy stuff. But from a distance, it's not messy. It just fundamentally is what it is. So when it happens, we don't want to go to war against it. So what happens for us, because it's so painful, we basically will try and fix it or avoid it or sedate it or distract ourselves from it. What we're learning here is to turn towards it and as counterintuitive as it seems, to welcome it with soft eyes you keep going back to the soft eyes thing. This is what are, really important. What, what does that do? Yeah. Well, what the soft eye has done is like anytime we're in a super arousing goic state, tension will come into the eyes. The mm, antidote is right. to soften the eyes. Right. So like right. the bear jumps out from behind a tree yeah. and you're like, oh, you yeah. have the shocked look. And also it's like when you soften your eyes, you're naturally in a welcoming state of consciousness. Yeah. Mm. So it's like, you know, if you, know, you knock on my door and I open the door, um, if my eyes are kind of tense, and I could say, oh, you're welcome. I'm pleased you're here. But my eyes are tense. You're not going to feel welcomed, right? So what happens when we soften the eyes and we look at something within with soft eyes, it's naturally welcoming of that. And what will start to happen is it will start to relax. Now, if we get strongly activated, the best thing is not to go to war against it, is actually to sink into it. To actually, and if you have some stability and awareness, you can do this. If, you, if you're really early on and you, know, you find a struggle to be present and center, you don't do this. You've got to work with someone, you've got to work with some trauma therapist. But this is when most of the time you can be stable and like you described, most of the time I'm centered, I'm connected, I'm aware, I feel pretty good. Something happens, intimate relationship, bang, I just go offline. It could, like, you know, the volcano goes. It's a whiteout. You completely wiped <laughs> out, right? And so because you have that stability and awareness, here's what you can do next time. Is the moment it happens, soften your eyes and smile. It'll be counterintuitive. You will not want to smile. Smile and almost allow yourself to sink into the middle of what you're experiencing inside of your body. In your body will be pain, will be tension, will be grief, will be anger. And in the middle of that is a hole. As you allow yourself to sink down through it, an incredible thing can happen. You drop through and you come into this open field of spacious awareness. It turns out your pain is a gateway available to you in that moment to come back home to your depths. We experience it as a gateway by turning towards it, welcoming it, and softening into it. The reason we don't do that is because we're full of fear. But that's a phenomenal discovery that was gifted and shared with me many years ago. So now when stuff comes up, and stuff comes up all the time, right? I'm in relationship as well, right? Stuff just, out of, just comes up. And what I've practiced now is like when it comes up, it's softening, sinking down through, and then you just drop right down and through. But if someone's listening to this and they're in the early stage of uh, recovery or they're in a development process, as a general rule of thumb, if it's very strong trauma, you've got to work through it with somatic experiencing or EMDR or brain spotting, any of these innovative approaches so to lessen the charge so you can feel safe around the pain. Because that's the challenge for most of us is that when we were children, we experienced pain. We had no idea what to do with it. And so what we do is we go to the escape pod, which is called the head. The head is an escape pod, We're not designed to live in the head. We're supposed to be in our body. But when our body is so full of unprocessed emotional charge, this is where we go. That's why people go into the head to try and fix it, to avoid it, to understand it, to conceptualize it. No, where you want to be is in your body 
being intimate with it. Mm, back right. to that, yeah. Yeah, back back yeah. to the intimacy yeah. piece again. Well, it, it, it's interesting as you mm. describe that, and it totally makes sense. I've been, over the years, becoming uh, much better at doing that with different emotions. It's easier. Like for me, anger is, right. re- I can go there very quickly. It comes yeah. up, uh, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's like, I always look at it like I'm ducking. Right. You know, it's like, nope, not getting me this time, fucker. I'm not going to attach <laughs> to that to that sensation or that feeling or that thought. And it's more of a ducking. Um, yeah. I don't get deeply angered very often. Sure. And one that has been really successful, I've been experimenting with the past couple of years is sadness and grief. Yeah. And when that comes up, my natural inclination is like, I need Instagram, I need a cigarette, I need sugar, like sure. fuck grief. I'm not going right. to feel this. This right. I know what this feels like and I need to get out of it. But, you know, having talked to brilliant people like you and learned a few things, I've really been experimenting with like, oh, I'm feeling some tears come up because there's a sense of loss or sadness. And being aware of that because of the conscious and awareness that you're describing, there is like a gap of separation between it just showing up and me yeah. being aware that it's showing right. up. And I played with just going, okay, we're going to do the crying thing now. Let's fucking do it. That's great. You know, and That's just great. let it rip. Yeah. And even very recently, I found myself um, in a really sad moment and mm. was in my car and some tears came up. And thankfully, I was alone. So, mm. you know, the ego wasn't afraid of being embarrassed sure. or not being a man or whatever. And I thought, hmm, now's a good time. Maybe I just need to work through this. And I just allowed myself and I was just sobbing in That's my car. Beautiful. You know, I pulled my car over and I was like, ah. That's like great. a child, you know, I felt dumb in one sense, but I intuitively knew that that's where the healing was. Right. And it's, it's, it's almost, it's really like watching a child when they have a temper tantrum and they're right. screaming and crying. And, you know, as an adult, you can watch their little personality yeah. freaking out and you know, they're just going to kind of um, work through it sure. and they're going to burn themselves out. Yeah, They just and need it, space. Yeah. And so I kind of allowed myself and my inner child, I guess, mm. to have that experience. And then and I kind of weeped and moaned for a minute. And then it was just like kind of over and I felt fine. You feel good. Right? Yeah. You feel it was okay. like, oh, that wasn't that hard. Yeah. yeah. I mean, not to say, yeah. you know, that the situation yeah. is awesome at all, but it's just, it's really interesting when you can be present through that and allow it to happen. And I think I even emphasized it a little bit just to make sure that I got it all out. That's and really then, you know, there, there were more waves later and, sure. you know, I'm sure we'll continue to yeah. be to be felt and experienced, but I I actually really get a kick out of that because when you avoid that sadness and grief, it seems like it's just going to last forever. So you have to avoid it because you'll never be able, there's going to be no end to the pain. Because not being processed, not being allowed. Right. And through those practices, it's almost like, you know, when you get a Charlie horse, someone, you know, you knock yourself with a hammer or something. It's like the more you resist that moment of pain, the longer it seems to last. But if you just go, okay, let me just really be with this pain in my knee it's so quickly dissipates. Exactly. And you're walking away going, God, that was no big deal. I just, it's the fighting it that made it It's the fighting the resistance. So the very nature of the ego is resistance. Where there's resistance, there's ego. Mm. And so what you're learning is I can be present, open and aware, engaging with reality. Reality is whatever's arising. Oh, so sadness is here. So from present, open and aware, I can engage with this and allow it. Now, what we do in psychological fitness is we teach you how to expand your bandwidth of allowable experience. So some people say yes to anger, no to sadness, yes to happiness, no to love. And what you're learning is this unconditional welcoming and engaging of whatever reality is showing up. We all have a direct inner experience. That is your experience of reality. When you can be with that, In a way that's unconditionally welcoming, everything that comes up, comes up, flows, and releases. Let's talk about grief because it's hugely important. Grief, when you eventually encounter this wellspring of grief, which we all have with inside of us, that is, for me, when I work with my students, when they start to grieve, I know they're deepening. Because on the other side of grief is depth. And so, particularly for guys who struggle with grief, one of the most important things we can do is allow grief to grieve. And what that means is we all have lots of hurts and pain and sadness and regrets inside of us. And most of us live as though it ain't happening. So we just wall ourselves off and pretend it ain't happening. Are you kidding me? It's like, 
saying no to your grief is like holding a beach ball underwater. And most of us have hundreds of beach balls we're holding underwater. That takes a lot of energy. Ever try to hold a beach ball underwater? Mm -hmm. That is how it is. When we refuse to turn towards that which is emerging moment by moment and we resist it, we're essentially getting our hands and pushing that a beach ball underwater. Now all of my energy and focus is on pushing this down rather than being here engaging life. So when we have an unconditional welcoming relationship to whatever's showing up, the beach ball comes up. Amazing, it's just come up. That's a gift. It's on its way out. It is being represented for this time to be seen, welcomed, and allowed. It will keep representing until that happens. So the gift is you're just allowing it. It moves. It's no big deal. And a really good exercise for anyone listening to this is make a list of uh, all the people you still hold grudges against, right? Big and small. You're stuck. There's a beach ball inside of you relating to the person that you're holding down, either alone or with the support of someone who you trust and can support you. Allow yourself to get in touch with that. But when it comes at this time, welcome it as it arises and allow it to move through your system. Allow anger and rage to come through and out of your system. Allow sadness and grief to come through and out of your system. And pretty quickly, you move to a sense of freedom. But then what you notice is it's waves upon waves. And as you enter life, present, open, aware, engaging with reality, you just allow it all. And then what you realize, oh my gosh, I've spent most of my life avoiding reality, not being present, completely distracted, engaging in stuff that doesn't matter. No wonder I felt disconnected and unfulfilled and unable to hold an intimate relationship with someone who I really care about. And so when we understand that the personal development piece, that our inner work is foundational to a healthy and fulfilling life, for most people, they start looking after the body, which is the kind of level entry kind of stuff. It's foundational. It's super important because we want a body that works for us. We want a body that provides us with the energy um, so we can get on with life. But equally important and definitely the next level is you got to start working with your psychology. It's hugely important. It's a game changer and then shifting into awareness and then you work with it all. And then you realize, oh my gosh, I'm here on planet earth. It's a gift. I've got to take care of my vehicle, my assigned vehicle, which is this body-mind. And I'm going to use this body-mind in service of what matters most. Then you're conscious, you're free, you're human, you're doing what you're doing, making plenty of mistakes along the way, and you're okay, and you care deeply. Can you talk a little bit more about the potential trap of getting stuck in the physical health realm. Yeah. I think for a lot of people, like we were talking about earlier, I think they can go keto and become enlightened. Right. Yeah. That'd be nice. I I think what we're like, when we're at a health conference here, you know, and everyone wants the latest and greatest gadget and supplement and herb. And I'm into all that stuff. I do a million things a day to just be me. Um, And I love it all. And it's a hobby and a crutch and all of, all of that at once. (laughs) Um, but at a certain point, is that an attachment or a limitation? Yes. You know, to feel yes. all the, as though, and I, this is from subjective experience, as though one is not um, complete without yeah. the rituals and without the things. And I, I right. know for me, there definitely is a high degree of attachment. And sometimes it's difficult to find the balance between, you know, is this an attachment in the negative sense that yeah. I feel like I can't function without all the things? Yeah how much of it is that and how much of it is, well, I'm already complete and I don't need anything, but this mm. just makes me extra. <laughs> you right, know what I mean? right. And so I grapple with that myself sometimes. And I think sure. people that, that I work with and people in my community also kind of struggle with like, when is too much enough yeah. Yeah. kind well, of thing. Well, there's, you know? there's some golden rules of thumb. Uh, what we want to do is we want to live life consciously and not compulsively. If something is compulsive, it will come with tension and contraction and a sense of grasping. 
That's me when I check in a hotel room and check the EMFs and look at all the blue light and yeah. want to change all the light bulbs. Yeah. I'm not relaxed in that yeah, moment. Yeah, you're not. No, so it's coming, No, I walk so in and I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, oh, God, God, I got to change this environment. It's going to give me cancer. You know right, what I mean? Exactly, yeah. I mean, it's not that extreme. So but- what you can also do is you can, you can see that happen and then you can go back to my softening, smiling, welcoming the underlying tension that has represented itself to be seen welcomed and allowed. You release the tension, you sink down back into awareness, and then you sort your room out. Right, so it doesn't right. stop you from doing it. And so what we're right. doing is we're living consciously and not compulsively. So that is the key. So when I see people tense around, it's like with, oh my gosh, with food and diet. I mean, really, it's like <laughs> what we want is a relaxed, informed relationship to food so that food works for us. But it's relaxed, open, and informed. Right. So that's not like checking the ingredients at the Whole, Whole Foods hot bar and having a panic attack because of the canola oil. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, you see me going through the menus. I'm like, canola, canola, <laughs> yeah, canola. I'm like, all, ah. Yeah, I know, it's all canola, right? <laughs> yeah. so, that, so that's the kind of challenge. So what you can do is the moment you see that pattern, it's just a pattern. Right. It's beautiful. It's, a, it's an amazing pattern because it's a pattern that cares. Remember, it comes from right. ego, but the ego cares. Right. You welcome, you smile. That's why humor is so important. You see the pattern, you smile, you know exactly what's going on here. You shift your state. That's the first thing. You reconnect with presence that you are. Just breathe into your lower belly, tune to space, and a soft smile. It's almost like you come back to sanity. You come back to centeredness. You're open and you're aware. And then you take a look and say, I don't want that because canola is in it. But there's no tension. There's no compulsivity. There's no desperation. There's no grasping. There's no narrative and story going on. It's just simply direct, clear seeing. I don't want that. I don't want, there's no, there's no drama. Mm, right. Right. So right. it's a really, and I see a lot of particularly young guys who, you know, come and, and train with me and they're on so many supplements. And, and, and when I say to them, you know, um, when you make your decision about the supplements, what state of consciousness are you in? That's always the first thing you want to check in, right? I.e., is this coming from your conditioned ego or is it coming from you as awareness? Go to awareness first, then make your decision and monitor for tension. It's like and, uh, something I was shared with me a long time ago. It's like, you know, if you're into self-help, like a lot of us are into self-help, we've got all the books, right? And we read the books. And so here's a, a really amazing thing. When next time you read a book, the moment you get tense and you notice tension coming in and grasping and soften, stop and don't do anything and just continue to sink into that softness. And then if you pick up the book again and read it, so be it. And if not, just leave it. I.e., don't do life from tension and grasping and see what happens. And what most people find is they tap into this intuitive knowledge as to what to do, where to do it, when to do it, how to do it, without all of the drama, without all of the tension and grasping. So that's what it really means to live consciously. So like, you know, I work out, I take the supplements, I like the tech and stuff, but I just check in. Is like, where's this coming from? Is it, oh, am I present, open and aware when making this decision? That's, that's the default. Before, you know, if, you know, if my wife says to me, and, and he's talked to you about something, right? I mean, that normally strikes terror into the heart of most guys. Right? So, what I have to do is, I know if I do not attune back into awareness, I will go into my defendedness and I know exactly what's going to happen. So, my number one priority is always shift first until eventually you just live from that, but shift first into awareness to make decisions from there. And what it does, it immediately opens you up to do two dimensions of reality most people don't experience. One, Simplicity to beauty. You start to see beauty. You start to experience simplicity. You sense there's a greater intelligence than I working through and around everything. You know your synchronicities. You feel a lot more grateful. You feel less like you have to work life out. You have to get it right. You have to sort this out. And you realize, gosh, it's like life works for you when you align with it. And it may not give you what you want, but number one priority is as you go about your day and live your life, remain attuned to your direct inner experience, welcoming that, 
attuning to the spaciousness around you and within you, which is the context, live your life from that. And whatever comes up, as best you can, welcome it. And there's many times you don't, and many times you mess up, and many times you lose the plot. Don't go to war with it. Learn the lesson. Welcome the shame. Welcome the guilt. Get the help. Get the support. And maybe like yourself, you know, one thing that's been super important is to have a mentor, have a coach, have good friends who are also committed to living this way as well. Because when we live from ego, we're creatures of denial and distortion. It's like, I don't believe a word I think about myself. And you start to realize I cannot, I cannot trust my thinking. And I will not. What is I trust life? What is life? Life is just what is. I trust that. I trust that. I do not trust. If my thought, if my head makes up a story about you or about me, I know it's not true. And when you start to see that and see through that, there's great freedom. Show me a man that keeps his own counsel and I'll show you an idiot. (laughs) (laughs) It's one of my my favorites whenever I find myself like, okay, I'm going to figure this out. Luke, let's have a talk with yourself. Like I already lost, you know, it's like so often when I'm in a stuck place, I need to call someone. And it's amazing even, you know, someone doesn't even necessarily need to be a coach or have any profound wisdom about them. Oftentimes, is it not just an objective point of view where someone can say, hey, I see your point, but have you considered this thing? Right. Because they're not attached to the outcome and they're not emotionally charged about it. So they have an arbitrary kind of point of view, which I think is really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in fact, it's, it's the next level of development, which is where you realize the real goodness in life, the real creativity life happens through collaboration and relationship. It's all about relationship, but learning how to relate from awareness, not from ego. That's where you realize it's all about relationship. It's all about coming home to this moment with this person, with this community from awareness and being with that. Because there's magic when you get two people together who are committed to the truth, who are open. There's magic. And what unfolds between those two people and between that group is above and beyond what the individual can conceive and experience. So true. I mean, that's been the most transformative thing in my life is being in groups of people that are all working toward the same goal, (laughs) you know, especially in the context of recovery. It's like, you can try to do shit. You can do shit on your own. (laughs) Get a room full of other idiots that are struggling with the same problem. And all of a sudden you guys figured it out. You know, it's like magic. But yeah, it's that one of my core principles is keep holy company. Right. You know, and that's to surround ourselves with people that are like-minded and, as you said, share values, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which brings us to our next question, actually, that I was going to get to. Um, and that is, it's okay. How important are interpersonal relationships and community? And do you feel that culturally we've really gotten away from that? Mm based on our roots as hunter-gatherer people that would have right. been in a tribe of 50 or 60 people and you would have been held by all the different members of the tribe as an infant and yeah. there was so much more human touch and human connection and yeah. true intimacy and emotional connection. Yeah. And I think now we're so connected with social media, right? but not so connected. you know. And I find myself sometimes just feeling isolated and alone. And then I'll, right. like last night I ran into Shaman Durek and he's the best hugger. Mm-hmm. And he gave me a big hug and he'll, he'll hold on to you as long as it, until you get awkward, you know, yeah. and I don't, I'm, I'm down. <laughs> and he just helped me. And I was like, oh my God, I'm starving for a hug. Yeah. You know, I had that conscious yeah. awareness. I really, yeah. I'm, I need that human touch. Yeah, we do. And yeah. what would be your perspective yeah. on, on that, you know, yeah. on, on physical connectedness and community? It, it is essential. It is foundational. The problem is society's become sick. And most people, because they're located in the ego and not in their true nature as awareness, have also become sick. And so we're kind of in this strange place where we need to connect, be physically connected in community and to relate. But we're also surrounded by a lot of people, if they're not willing to face reality, are also sick themselves and and in a lot of dysfunctionality. So you can say, I want to be with you, but I but something's not right here. I can't be with you because if, you, if I can't be with you and you're not open and attuned and allow me to be who I am and have my best interests in the heart, then how can I be with you? We've lost healthy relating. That's our kind of greatest challenge. That's why a lot of people find such great solace in the 12-step recovery movement because they come into a community of people where they're kind of welcomed. 
Right. And yeah. there's no ulterior motive. Right. There's no profit motive. Right. There's no profit motive. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not here to get something from you. I'm here because I'm a human being and I'm here because we have shared challenges and I'm sensing into something magic in this community that can help us all. So until someone finds like a spiritual development group, a self-help group or a recovery group, a lot of people feel very, very alone. You see, the purpose of community is to instill values into the young folk Mm. that guide them in life. And because we no longer have that, we're trying to go on our own, trying to make it all up, and that's, we're getting into trouble. Damn, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. So in the, in the natural framework of the human experience, the way we would have evolved in communities, yeah. the elders would have been passing along the that's principles it. and laws, the universal right. laws that would right. have guided each individual as they move into adulthood exactly. and the different right. phases of life. Yeah. Now we're learning from fucking... Instagram, well, <laughs> you well, know, whatever kids uh, well, are, you well, know. learning from each other and that's the problem, right? right so what right. happens is uh, most of us are stuck in adolescent consciousness. This comes mm. back to the, the ego is not being a problem. It's kind of like, you know, we start off with this immature dysfunctional ego. What we need is an upgraded ego to mature and functional, right? And that maturation process is done within community and support and relationship, which is that as a community, I can reflect back to you the areas that you need to work upon, but we'll provide you with the support and the role models as to how to be in the world in a respectful, attuned, and mature way of being. When we don't have that, we turn to our immediate peer group and we've got young children connecting with each other through social media and they're looking to each other as a source of wisdom and insight how to be. Oh my gosh, this is a problem. They need to look wow. to their parents and to their community because it's the role of the parent is to instill in you a value system that will serve you and empower you to show up in the world, to be you and to be at your best and to bring your offering to the society and to community. That's what parents are there for, right? But now no one's doing that and parents are so distracted and so unconscious themselves and so the children are scrambling around for some sense of belonging and orientation. So they go to their friends and their friends are the same psychological biological age as them. And then it's going down into a black hole. So we're losing our children. The parents are either pretending it ain't happening or they're getting angry about it. And we've lost our societal structure. So we need to be in a healthy relationship, but we have to get real is like we have to find our tribe, our community of people, even if it's just one therapist, one mentor, one coach, one person, one friend you start off with that you can have a sane and open and vulnerable conversation with. Because for a lot of people, we live in denial. Ego is a creature of denial. And so when you can tell another person and say, you know what? I'm struggling. Things aren't so good. There is great power and strength and beauty when you align with reality. Remember engaging reality? Part of the right. psychology. When you engage right. reality, it's like, I'm struggling here. I don't know what to do. I'm done. I'm done with this. And it's such a powerful move when you can get really clear and honest about what are you done with? I'm done with shouting at the kids. I'm done with running away. I'm done with drinking myself to oblivion and I'm just done with it. And if you get in touch with that doneness and you go deep into that and sink through in the company of a good conscious human being who holds your interests at heart, that can be profoundly important for you. That can be a game changing moment for you when you're just simply done. What are the other stages of, uh, development that you're talking about. Yes. We went into the first couple starting with yeah, the physical. Give me a run through of your framework. Yeah. I find it really yeah, interesting. Yeah, of course. So this is kind of, it's oversimplified. It's a basic map, but here's what it looks like. You can imagine four islands on this beautiful ocean. Island one, two, three, four. Island one is victim consciousness. So victim consciousness where pretty much we all start. And victim consciousness, I live at the surface level reality, identified with my ego, attempt to control and manipulate everything. And I'm in the blame game. I'm in gossip. I'm constantly going around judging others. I'm either making myself superior than others or inferior than others. It's the home of trauma, 
It's the home of addictions and compulsions. And because I ain't dealing with my stuff, I'm regurgitating my problems, my issues onto the people around me. It's pretty messy. Now, if you're very fortunate, what happens is you have a breakdown. And this would be, I'm on my knees. I can't go on this way. My addictions have brought me to my knees. When that happens, you find your way to a bridge which connects island one to two. Island two is Victor Consciousness. When you arrive on Island 2, there's a refugee camp waiting for you called 12-Step Recovery. And you arrive into 12-Step Recovery or you arrive into treatment or you arrive into therapy or some people go the personal development route, which I'll come to in a minute. That's another way of doing it. But you arrive then, you realize, oh my gosh, I can rebuild myself with new principles, new practices that are built on honesty and awareness. This is Victor Consciousness. This is when we start to realize I can make a big difference the way I feel by what I eat, my environment I hang out in, the people I hang out with, the way I work with my mind. And so we start to rebuild this kind of more healthy, functional self. This is the world of personal development, self-help, uh, recovery. It's a very, very exciting, heady time when you're entering into it. But you realize after time in here, this is not it. And what you sense is <laughs> something is missing here. What is missing? It's called depth. Now, depth's really hard to define. So that's when normally people go spiritual path, start meditating. They're looking for a sense of connection and peace and openness that they perceive the missing. But Island 3 is beckoning. Island 3 is vessel consciousness. And the path to Island 3 is active surrender. Active surrender means I am willing to do what is required to engage reality fully from awareness while simultaneously letting go. Anytime I think or notice I am telling myself I should do this, I should not do this. This is who I am. This is how it is. The moment I'm tensing up around a concept or an idea, I'm going to see that soften and smile. And I'm going to start letting go, letting go and softening. That's why the softening piece is so quick. And what is amazing is you, the ego, can't make the next transition happen. Life makes it happen. Life takes you when it's ready. You can either cooperate with it or resist it. How do you cooperate with it? You fall into alignment with your moment, present moment experience by welcoming it. You can just cooperate. You can't make it happen. And what happens is eventually life takes you down the sinkhole into awareness and you literally experience a shift in identity. You go from, I am a separate sense of self, disconnected to the world, compulsively judging everything as me and not me as good and bad. And now I'm just in life. I'm here, I'm open, I'm aware and attuned. More often than not, stuff happens. I get triggered and activated. I turn to that and I smile and soften and sink through or work with a therapist. And basically life pulls you in. And then you experience life as I'm here, but there's this vast and creative intelligence working through me and around me. It's called vessel consciousness. And then stage four is verity consciousness which is where, there's a set, where the sense of separation just dissolves. It's just life. Life is. That's all you can say about it. Life is. And that's a very helpful developmental map for a lot of people. So they can just get a sense of wherever you're at is fine. As long as you align with it, welcome it. Um, but you can give a good sense of what's available to you. But active surrender is the key. Eckhart Tolle talked about in one of his books, um, in talking about surrender, and I love this, metaphor that he gave for it. He said, well, surrender is not getting your car stuck in the mud and just resigning to the fact that it's there and just sitting there and rotting. It's working your ass. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. It's working your ass off to get your car unstuck from the mud, but without resistance and negativity. Exactly. Yeah. So it's going, here it is. Cool. Let's start shoveling. Oh, this is interesting. Wow. It's fun to shovel, you know? And I think that's the the struggle people have with the idea of surrender, especially very yang proactive people. Yeah. Is it's like, God, if surrender, that puts me back in victimhood. Yeah. And what you're suggesting is that no, in fact, surrender opens you to a higher state of wisdom and consciousness through that intuition where you're guided to yeah. work yourself out of a tight situation. Exactly. Yeah. Because you're not being blinded by the lower states of emotion, right? It's right. like trying to make a decision when you're pissed off. Right. It's like you're gonna you're gonna yeah. make a horrible decision right. until you're able to surrender through that anger. Right. And get to the other side of it and calm down and go, ah, okay, no, I see what we need to do. Because, right? uh, because this, you're now in clear seeing, there's just clarity. Right. You just know what to do. That's called intuitive knowing. Right, right. 
Wow. Good stuff, dude. And mm. with this framework that, that you came up with, um, mm. how, how do people work with you in terms sure. of you know, coaching and different programs that you have and things like that, where they could get you know, on board with this and start practicing. It. Right. So uh, you can go to uh, humanpotentialinstitute.com. So we have a human potential coach training program over nine months. We've just launched our psychological fitness specialist training, eight week online program, where basically I distill all of these practices and principles I've just shared with you into an eight week online program. And you just don't do it for yourself, but you have to because it's the integrity piece. You can actually learn how to use these tools and help other people using them as well. So we're super excited about that. Um, I've got a couple of books, True Happiness, The Mind Body Bible, my personal website, drmarkatkinson.com. Um, but check out humanpotentialinstitute.com and we've got loads of courses and programs there. My deepest passion is teaching and uh, it's just I just love that the opportunity to just sit down and just share about stuff that matters is 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 one of life's greatest pleasures. So uh, anyone who's interested, was resonant or int- intrigued by what I'm sharing today, take a look at that. Oh, I, I'm certain that people will. Um, you have a really sort of pragmatic way to approach it. I think some of these things are difficult for people, mm-hmm. and you, you, I've noticed you're careful. You, you know, there's words you don't use that could be off-putting. You're not talking about God or spirituality and things like that. And I have a hard yeah. time sometimes. I just, <laughs> I'm too lazy to try to step around those. I'm just like, trust God. You know, that's like, that's the motto of my life. Trust God, God's will. And it, you know, it's hard to not sound religious. And yeah. I think that's, it's yeah. tough for some people that have attachments to certain ideas and you have to really be, um, be clever with your wording and right. being able to do that. To me, you're talking about like living a life that's surrendered to God and that's the answer. Right. And and doing and in doing so, you are given integrity and wisdom that then the next logical step is to be of service. And then your right. whole life is about contribution and contribution right. is where fulfillment and joy really lies, right? right? But I love, you just have a very simple and approach approachable way of explaining it and a, and a really great energy about you. So I'm just so grateful to be able to spend time with you. Yeah, thank this you for cool. inviting me. It's very yeah, cool. yeah. And so um, in closing, who have been three teachers or teachings that you've learned from that our mm. audience might be able to go look up and also learn from? Yeah, <laughs> well, the first one was my wife, so they can't look her up. But, <laughs> okay. but she's been my greatest teacher for sure. Wow. Um, I, I would say, of course, Eckhart Tolle was, was really the, the kind of first person who, uh, for me, uh, just something about his writing evoked inside of me this kind of sense of open presence. I, it just, it was so, it was so instrumental uh, kind of for me. So that would be the first thing. Uh, the next guy would be Michael Brown, who wrote a book called The Presence Process. And The Presence Process is often described as the how-to of what Eckhart Tolle points to. Oh, wow. And so he's a South African-born teacher um, who's just done really incredible work. And, and a lot of his work is maybe similar in spirit to what I've shared with you, which is learning to welcome and work with these beach balls that arise, to welcome and work with reality. So definitely check out uh, Michael Brown. And um, I would also say, um, gosh, who else would it be? You know, what Dave Asprey has really helped me, because Dave, I've worked with Dave for a couple of years now, is he's really helped me um, dial in on the biological hacking piece. And I really see how important that is because you've really got to dial in your biology so it frees up energy and capacity to do this work. Because a lot of people in the spiritual path traditionally neglect their body. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. Look at all the famous gurus from India. Right. They're all either fat or skinny. (laughs) Right, exactly. (laughs) Look very malnourished. Right, not good. (laughs) And so... Uh, I've learned a lot from hanging out with Dave and I'm excited about his new book, Superhuman. And so, uh, you know, I'd definitely check that out as well. Yeah. I, you know, that's the other side of it is like, I guess I, I was going to say I struggle with it. I don't. I, mm. I think I just ponder this, but it's like, yeah. So the personal development, the psychology, psychological fitness, let's say, is the core. And mm. when that's there, then you start to care about your body and care about other people. Naturally. And your consciousness raises, so right. you just care about everything more, including your body. Right. And then we discuss the trap of getting stuck in the supplements and the vitamins and the things and thinking that's the answer. But on the other side of that, like in a pro biohacking thing, is it's really hard to be a good person 
even though you might be inherently kind, if your mitochondria are trash and right. you have no cellular energy, <laughs> right, you need it. I mean, I just know if I don't sleep, I'm 50% more of a dick. Exactly. You know I mean? exactly. If <laughs> Straight I don't get, correlation. <laughs> yeah. If I don't, I mean, that's just, that's my kryptonite is like not yeah. getting enough sleep. I just am not myself. Right. Exactly. You know, and so yeah. I don't matters. I think it's worth mentioning. I never want to discount, and obviously you don't either. The, mm. The physical part, I just like to share the awareness that it can be a trap if you, you know, continue on that hamster wheel of thinking, if I just get fit enough, I'll be happy. Right. Yeah. And the exactly. happiness comes from inside. Yeah, right. And and that's coming back to asking, am I doing this consciously or compulsively? Right. Right. And realizing in your own experience that what I seek is who I am. And to know who I am, I've got to dive beneath the everyday mental chatter. And one way you can do that is meditation, the other is yoga, time in nature being with uh, an intimate partner. And of course, as I just shared before, tuning to spaciousness, soft eyes, smile on the inside, sink into the lower body. That's another way. There's many, many ways, many, many paths. Yeah, amazing, dude. Very well-rounded conversation. Thanks for joining me today. You're most welcome. (laughs) Man, I got to say, I really appreciate you joining me for this conversation. I would be having these conversations just by myself for free because I learned so much and I'm so inspired. If you guys could have the experience of sitting down with a guy like Dr. Mark, toe to toe, eye to eye, uh, it's just such an incredible experience. It never ceases to amaze me um, how fortunate I am to have these opportunities. If you, if you want to get a taste for what this conversation might have been like, remember that almost every interview I do also has a YouTube video. So you can always watch the videos. Um, even when I travel, I do my best to, to make a video out of it. Sometimes they're not as nice as my home studio ones here uh, that I record in LA, but the ones abroad uh, definitely get recorded on video. So if you want to see Mark and some of our other guests in action, uh, you can remember that you can always find those at lukestory.com and just go to my video page and they're all there or you can find them on YouTube. And if you do find them on YouTube, make sure to subscribe because I think it makes you look cool when you have a bunch of subscribers or something. Uh, anyway... If you want to learn more about our show's sponsors, which they and I would, of course, appreciate, and once you try them out, you will too, you can find them all at lukestory.com forward slash store. So that includes Organifi, where you can uh, get a special discount code there to save 20% off. The Juve Red Light Therapy. I use this damn thing every day. Not even joking. You can also go to lukestory. I'm sorry. You can go to uh, juve.com forward slash luke. Enter the code luke at checkout and uh, get a special bonus. That's juve.com forward slash Luke. And of course, our friends over at Blue Blocks. That's blueblocks.com, B-L-U-B-L-O-X. If you want to save 15% over there, drum roll, please enter the code lifestylist. That's Blue Blocks. In fact, I just moments ago did an interview with um, Carrie Ann Moss, uh, who you will know from the, the film The Matrix, or the films The Matrix, as Trinity and... Uh, as she was leaving, she's like, oh man, I just love those blue blocks. I wear those every night. It's about time to turn them on because it was getting dark when she left. So even celebrities are wearing these damn glasses now, you guys. But seriously, you can find all that stuff and more over at lukestory.com forward slash store. Lastly, uh, don't miss this Friday's bonus episode, The Lost Shangri-La Tapes recorded at the infamous, no, not infamous, it's world famous studio in Malibu, California, where I sat down with Matt Maruka and talked about how to find God. And then Matt's coming back with us on Tuesday, uh, talking all about blue light versus sunlight. And that is a three hour, it might be the longest podcast I've ever done, maybe. I don't know, the deuterium ones might've beat this, but Matt and I sit down again in London uh, also, and just (laughs) just got crazy. So make sure you subscribe to the show so you don't miss that. Matt Maruka is a a lifestyleist fan favorite here. And so um, I know a lot of people are looking forward to both of those conversations uh, with the mic facing either way, Friday and Tuesday. Thank you so much for sharing your life with me and with our guests. And uh, thank you to Mark, who's such a wonderful human being and found time in his busy schedule uh, to sit down with me. Enjoy and I'll catch you Friday and Tuesday. This episode of the Lifestylist Podcast was produced by podcastmasters.net.